Hello, I'm Andrea Lewis, Director of the Maryland Center for the Book at Maryland Humanities. On behalf of my colleagues, Nancy Medema of the Iowa Center for the Book and Gwen Hervashen of Idaho Center for the Book, I'd like to welcome you to our state's Great Reads from Great Places author discussion. As affiliates of the Library of Congress, the state centers for the book help carry out the mission of the National Center for the Book. Together, we promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy nationwide. We also promote our state's literary heritage by placing a focus on books and authors with a connection to our state. Every year, as part of our participation in the Library of Congress National Book Festival, we each choose a book with a local connection. This is part of the Great Reads from Great Places initiative, which primarily focus on, focuses on young readers. You can learn more and find a list of this year's books at read.gov. The authors representing Maryland, Idaho, and Iowa this year on the Great Reads book list are together for this panel because their books are connected by the theme of activism and social justice. We're thrilled that the conversation will be moderated by Deborah Taylor. Deb is a recipient of the Coretta Scott King Virginia Hamilton Practitioner Award for Lifetime Achievement from the American Library Association and is now retired from her role as Head of Children and Youth Services at Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore. But Deb is still very much involved in the world of literature and the nurturing of future librarians. I'm going to turn things over to Deb now for introductions to our authors and for what promises to be a wonderful discussion. Deb. Thank you, Andrea. I am delighted to moderate this panel of distinguished authors um, who have written such important and um, life-changing and genre-bending books for young readers. Um, I'm pleased to introduce first off Lisa Klein Ransom, who is an author of picture books and middle grade novels, um, best known for her NAACP Image Award nominated picture book biography of Harriet Tubman before she was Harriet and her middle grade novel, which started a great series, Finding Langston. Yeah. <laughs> Joining her is as um, Annette Bay Pimatel, who grew up in Utah. And as an adult, she's lived all over the US as well as Europe and Africa. And she has written nonfiction books about people from the margins of history who have shaped our world. So we're really excited that she is with us. Um, her book, Mountain Chef, How One Man Lost His Groceries, Changed His Plans and Helped Cook Up the National Park Service won the 2017 Carter G. Woodson Award from the National Council of Social Studies. And Andrew Smith, welcome Andrew. He's an American author and short story writer, um, primarily in young adult fiction. He's written many novels, including the critically acclaimed Winger and Grasshopper Jungle. So we are so excited to be able to talk to you. These books are all very different, but they're, I bet you that we'll find lots of ways that we can connect the dots for all of our young readers. I'd like to start with you, Andrew. And um, we have a theme for this year, this year's festival, open a book, open the world. What do you think that means? Or does that mean anything to you to open a book and open the world? Well, I think when, uh, when a reader makes a connection with something that they're reading that they very often are going to experience things that they never really knew that they could be right in the middle of uh, and experiencing. And furthermore, I think that, especially when we talk about reading for young people, is that young people, you know, their awareness of uh, the others that are around them is very often pretty constrained to their family and their school and their local community. And by presenting a wide, diverse arrangement of topics and titles and subjects for for uh, young readers to explore. I think it gives people an opportunity to get inside the lives of others and make a more 
empathetic connection uh, to all of the people that we have in America and in the world. What do you think we, what do you think happens when a young person finds a book that challenges what they've already thought, you know, the way they've been taught from their family or the way they've been taught from their friends? What do you think happens to them when they, they find that they're challenged by something in a book? Well, um, speaking anecdotally, because I'm a classroom teacher, uh, this is my 30th year, and the times that I've seen that happen, uh, young readers will usually uh, come up to me and with kind of a lowered voice say, Mr. Smith, I found out this. <laughs> and then it opens up this whole uh, discussion about something that, uh, that they had assumed to be some alternate, you know, foreign kind of experience that they didn't realize was something that was really that universal and was close enough to them that they just maybe weren't aware of. It, it's definitely a conversation starter, though. I think the key is uh, to know the kid, know the young reader, know, know the person that we're, we're talking to, and know what kinds of things uh they're looking for and what is really going to kind of inspire and trigger that spark within them so important annette um you know the book that we're focused on this evening you know is about someone who really made a difference in the world what do you think happens when a young reader reads about um a real person's life who has had that kind of change who has made that kind of change when they were very young. Yeah, so I hope that what happens is that they can see themselves in the book. And it's been really fun to uh, share this book with students. Um, the book is uh, all the way to the top and it's about Jennifer Keelan Chapins, who was an activist who participated in the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And she and I have um, mostly virtually, except for the first week it came out, um, visited with students. And it's been really interesting to watch, um, to watch children interact with her and with the book, because I think it does give them a vision of the kind of power that children can have. And I think um, in particular, one class that Jennifer talked to that then they went out into their community and surveyed the businesses and sent letters to businesses that they felt like didn't have adequate wheelchair access. Um, so I think that sometimes when kids can see another child, um, I, I, fictional worlds are really important too, but I think that there's a role for nonfiction world to suggest the possibility in their own world and in their own life um, to change something. So you're really talking about a book being a catalyst for um, personal action as well? Is that yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think it's a catalyst for changing self-definition, for seeing themselves as not merely being a, a recipient of culture, but also being a, a participant in creating what the culture is, um, whether that's writing letters to businesses or a lot of kids have talked about um, their attitude toward other students in their school and things like that. And I think that books, um, both fiction and nonfiction books, can give kids a vision of a different way to be in, in their world. Yeah, that's, that's so important for them as they're developing who, what their personality is going to be, what, they're, what they've decided they're going to, how they're going to operate in the world. Um, yeah. Lisa, you, you took on a unique challenge um, with before she was Harriet, because, you know, I think most people think they know Harriet Tubman. Yeah. So when, when a young person opens your book, what do you hope that they see differently than what they already thought, already think they know about that, that person? Um, well, you know, uh, growing up when I used to read um, stories about, um, stories about enslaved people, um, a lot of the classroom discussions or history books that I um, was exposed to never really talked about the types of resistance um, that I um, later found out existed in, in terms of enslaved Blacks um, that they used to fight back against enslavement. Uh, for example, like 
learning to read or gathering information. So I never really heard much about those stories. Um, and so then one day, you know, I, I, I heard the story of Harriet Tubman and I was just really struck by, of course, you know, her heroism. And here is this black woman who escaped and came back, not just escaped, but came back again and again and again and helped others to um, escape as well. And so the, the challenge for me, she, you know, she just became this larger than life figure and it helped me a, a really shy introverted child also want to be as fearless and heroic and brave as Harriet Tubman. But the challenge for me in writing about her life, which is why I waited so long to write her story, is in finding a new way to tell her story. But um, one, I discovered that, you know, we know her as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, but she had so many other lives that she led. Um, and so when I was challenged with, you know, trying to find a way to write her story, I began thinking about my own mother who happens to be 96 years old and often talks to me about her own recollections of her childhood and the many lives that she has lived. And so I started thinking about Harriet in that way, about all the many lives that Harriet had, had lived. And so when, you know, you're writing for a new group of readers, you know, a lot of these readers have read, you know, the story of Harriet, the conductor on the Underground Railroad. So I thought, you know, what other lives had Harriet lived? And I started doing research and discovered that she had, you know, worked, she was a suffragist, that she was a nurse, that um, she was a spy. And I thought, you know, why not have Harriet tell her story from the perspective of an elderly woman, much like my mom, looking back on the many highlights of her life. So that's kind of how that story came together. You know, one of the things that I was struck by um, when I was when I was reading it was the whole idea that it felt so fresh, that it felt that even though I have lived in I've lived in Maryland my whole life, so you know I know lots of Harriet Tubman stories, uh, there was still a freshness to um, the way you told that story. And was that a particular challenge? Um, definitely, it was a particular challenge, and also I think by um, using verse to tell the story um, in a way that um, made the story kind of spare and um, almost told as like a whisper or in secret because you know a lot of the work that she did, did was in secret. Um, so I was trying to also capture a new voice while telling it in a new style. Um, I think using those two techniques, um, what is it called a reverse chronological technique I discovered that as I was, after I wrote the, the, the story. <laughs> um, using that technique, I think, helped to give it more of a, of a freshness for young readers. And I think, you know, um, readers are always looking for new versions of stories. I don't think that there are, you know, first of all, I, I don't think there are ever going to be too many Harriet Tubman stories, because I think that she is just um, a hero that we need to continue to celebrate and learn more about. Um, and so, you know, I think finding new ways to tell her story and finding the different layers of her story um, are, are, are always going to be needed. I'd like to, to shift gears for just a second because one of the things that I know that um, folks who are interested in books and reading love to find out about writers is what was your reading life like when you were a young person? And that, let's start with you. What was your reading life like when you yeah. were a young person? The age of the young people who read your book. So our family moved a lot and um, we had a lot of books, but then we did a major cross country move. And my parents decided it would be too expensive to take all of the books. And so we tragically had to give up um, all of these books that we had loved. And we moved cross country to um, Illinois and we lived in a very tiny town and we got there and discovered that there was no library. And it was a very deep tragedy for our family. So the um, this element, or I, I can't remember if maybe it was the junior high school. Anyway, in the summer, one of the schools would open up their school library and we would go every week when it opened up because we had to get books. Um, and so I read the books that were there on the shelves. Um, I don't remember reading a lot of picture books. I think that uh, we we privileged the longer books because we didn't have, we wanted something that would last. Um, so I was a very big fan of the uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder books, um, anything that was very, very thick. 
I also really um, later really loved Zilpha Keatley Snyder's books, uh, mm-hmm. her fantasy books, especially that she has a trilogy. And I loved the, um, the world that I loved any book that I could sink into that world and just like become part of that world. So. You know, I think I read some on one of the, um, the, the, the bios that you read Childhood of Famous Americans. Yes. From that. And um, th- I felt an immediate kinship. <laughs> <laughs> of course, as you said, I think I, as, I, as I read, they would be considered historical fiction today because all that made up dialogue, all of those kinds of things. But yeah. they, they made me a biography reader. Yeah, and that is one thing that they did really well is that they did create an imaginative world that I felt like I really got to know Benjamin Franklin or Helen Keller. I I loved books about Helen Keller. I loved books about Benjamin Franklin. Um, And I'm really grateful for that that introduction to nonfiction. I hope young readers today get an introduction to nonfiction that is actually nonfiction. Um, But there are wonderful books um, and really imaginative structures like Lisa's book that I think um, do the same thing really beautifully, like allow children to enter in in new and imaginative ways into someone else's life. Yeah, I think that's true. Andrew, how about you? What was your what was your childhood reading life like? Well, uh, like Annette, my family moved an awful lot as well. In fact, I was the first kid in my family born in America, and my mother couldn't speak English. So she started to learn how to speak English when I was in elementary school. And so I would read to her sometimes, and or I would help her with her reading. But um, we didn't have very much money at all. And the time when I'd have money, uh, pocket money, I would get on my little uh, Schwinn bike and ride down to the mall and you know I my childhood was horrible because I was put ahead in school and so I was two years younger than my classmates so I didn't have an I didn't have very many friends and the friends I did have we often uh read the same books but when I would go uh ride down to the mall I would go to bookstores we used to have a lot of bookstores in America like B Dalton and Walton's (laughs) books Walden books and um, and I'd go to these bookstores and I would go to the fiction section and I would buy like Annette, I would buy I would buy the thickest books I could find because you could buy these old, you know, the Peng, the Signet classics and stuff like that, uh, you know, for like a couple dollars. And I was so I I picked books like Dostoevsky. I picked The Idiot <laughs> or I picked Joseph, like Joseph Conrad, Thomas Hardy. I read uh Gosh, uh, the return of the native and Jude the obscure because I liked him for some reason when I was like 14 years old. But I thought, you know, I was just trying to get the most bang for my buck. And I was just looking for whatever had the most pages in it, because that book would last me until I had enough money for another one. That I think everybody can relate to trying to get as much out of the book um, as possible, especially if you have to make that purchase. Uh, Lisa, what was your what was your reading life like as a young kid? Well, I, I, I think the, I'm just on the odd woman out here because I never moved. I lived in the same house <laughs> my entire life. In fact, my mom still lives in the same house, and we still have the same phone number. So, um, <laughs> I grew up outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I lived in this um, uh, you know medium sized town, Malden, Massachusetts. And then we had this great library. So my mom and I used to go to the library all the time. And um, we had a lot of books in the home. And I honestly don't remember reading that many picture books either. Um, My mother would read a book and she would talk to me a lot about it. And then I would try to read it as well. Um, But I would always go to the library with my mother, without my mother. I would stack up on as many books as I possibly could and bring them home. Um, I was really drawn to books about girls and women. Um, I, I, the first book that I really remember just devouring was the diary of Anne Frank. Mm-hmm. Um, I, um, was really struck by, I was, um, one of the only African-American, um, we were one of the only African-American families in our town. And certainly I was the only African-American in my classroom. And I was really kind of struck by the story of this, um, this, this Jewish girl could also be, feel, feel like an outcast kind of like, like I did. 
And um, so I was really struck by her story. Um, and then I remember also reading my mother's uh, copy of The Color Purple um, when I started high school. Mm -hmm. And I think those two books kind of shaped me into a writer. Like I, I love stories about um, women, about the kind of the bravery of women who, who are existing in difficult times and kind of like this raw honesty. So I, I would say like most of the books that I liked when I was young and even like in through high school and college are usually centered around women's stories and women We've had to overcome difficult circumstances. My my children have always said to me, so you don't like um, happy stories. There are things called beach reads that I think that mm -hmm. people people actually read and they enjoy. I, I just, I, I do like stories with, with some teeth to them and some, some substance, but I've, I've just always loved a library and I loved the way when I walked into a library, I felt so powerful. Like I remember feeling like when you go into a library, I thought if I read every, I could read every book here and I could know just about everything there is to know. <laughs> it's just, I just, just remember feeling, so that's, I still feel the way when I walk into a library. Um, so yeah, I, I love libraries. I lived in libraries and um, that's still kind of my life. <laughs> tell me, how did you, tell us, how did you become familiar with Jennifer Keelan's story? and uh, decide that you wanted to, to tell that story um, and, and get it out there for young people to know about her. Yeah, um, so it, it actually started with reading another nonfiction picture book. I read When the Beat Was Born by Laban Carrot yes. And I was totally astounded that it was, it was, it's a great book, but I was especially astounded that it was about something that happened in the 1980s. And I thought, I, I was an adult in the 1980s. I should be able to look back at the 1980s and think of what important things happened and be able to write, have all the benefit of my own lived experience. And so I asked myself, what important thing happened around that? And I was actually surprised that I immediately came up with an answer and it was the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so I did a little literature survey and didn't really find books for kids about that. And that astounded me because the, it has changed our, our physical world a huge amount. And I realized that the children I was writing for probably have no idea about why there are ramps and why there are braille panels and elevators, why they go to school with kids with disabilities, which I surely never did. Um, and so I started researching the legislative history of it. And as I researched the legislative history, I found the story of Jennifer. And at that moment, I realized that it needed, to, that I could write a book that was not only about the Americans with Disabilities Act, but also about a child's role in changing our world. Um, but it's obviously not my story. I am not currently living with disabilities. Um, and I realized that it was not a story that I could just write from research. And so um, I did a little sleuthing. I used my husband's mad internet skills to find an, an email address and um, contacted Jennifer. And uh, it happened that it was a, a pretty good time for her. She was finishing up her college degree at the time. And she told me that nobody had ever asked her to tell the story before and that she was indeed really excited about the idea of telling kids about her story. And so she worked really closely with me throughout the process of writing, answered many, many, many questions, which came at her very often. And then she's been really involved in promotion of the book. She wrote the foreword for the book and uh, we consider it our book together. But yeah, it was a wonderful moment to realize that it could be a book about what kids can do as well about a, as about a really important moment in American history. It sounds like um, it started off with you just interested in, in telling a story or telling something about a time frame, but it turned into something else. It turned into something even bigger. So how did, that, how did that happen? Um, yeah, it was the moment when I found um, photographs of Jennifer and accounts of the Capitol crawl. And I saw her um, crawling up the steps of the Capitol. And I, like so many people who watched her at the time, was just amazed at the thought that a child ended up having such a significant 
impact on getting um, newspapers to report on her, getting the TV to report on her, which in turn led to a lot of pressure on Congress. And so it was that moment, um, sometimes when I'm looking for a topic, there are moments when I just get really excited because I recognize that there's something that's bigger than the original story I was looking for. And it was that kind of moment that I recognized that if she were willing to tell her story for kids, that this was a bigger story than the one I had thought I wanted to tell. Yes. Uh, Andrew, you know, when um, your book came out, when, Grass, when Grasshopper Jungle came out, everybody talked about how unusual it was. And um, it was seen as, you know, um, this is really a strange book. I don't think it reads very strange anymore. Do you? <laughs> what we've lived through the last few years, it doesn't feel so strange anymore. We kind of have that uh, collective experience now, don't we all? Uh, yeah. and, uh, but sure, at the time, and, you know, I had, I, I, I had no intention of ever allowing anybody to look at it. I was only writing it for myself. And then just a couple of uh, strange things happened. Um, my, my son went through the same thing that I did. Uh, he left, he went to college at the age of 16. And so there was this, you know, I was, I, I felt sorry for him. I was very proud of him too. And, uh, and he, uh, from his dorm room, 600 miles away, he sent me an email and he said, dad, is there, have you been writing anything lately? Because I'm really, I'd really like to read something that you've written because he's read all of my books. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, I said, you know, well, I'll send you the manuscript that I'm doing right now, but it's, I want you to let me know if you think I need therapy after you read it. <laughs> <laughs> and so he read it and he just loved it so much. And he kind of uh, talked me into um, having my agent take a look at it. And then the rest is history. I hope I, I hope I didn't break uh, the future of the United States by writing something so strange. But yeah, I think we have all kind of gone through something similar. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we had talked about discussing was, you know, how could a book help kids get through the global pandemic? And I think it would be really fascinating to have kids understand that this came out of your imagination and, you know, look what happened. Indeed. <laughs> Lisa, I'd like to, to ask you a little bit about your writing process. Uh, when you were when you were working on um, when you were working on um, before she was Harriet, well, what? How did you get started with? Once you decided that that was the story you were going to tell, and that that was how, and you were going to tell it a little differently, what was the process after that? You know, I start I start the way I started the way I usually start, which is to just um, get as many books as I could possibly get so I just I start at the library I start taking out books ordering books and I pile up my desk I'm hoping that you don't hear my dog whining in the background because now of course he wants to go out um, I just pile my desk with tons and tons of books and I'm just gonna pull him over here as I scratch him um, I pile my desk with tons and tons of books and I read um, I read until I realize I'm reading the same material over and over and over again. And I think I've, I've already read this three or four times already. And I just take, um, I, I take lots and lots of notes. I have notebooks that I fill. Um, I usually, I don't, you know, take notes on, I don't use any particular um, writing system on my desktop. I use actual old school notebooks. I like the idea of um, writing my notes. I feel like it imprints in my brain a little differently. And so I, I write my notes in my notebook. I kind of highlight areas that I think would work best um, for young readers or things that stand out to me as things that I really want to include. And once I go through piles and piles of research, I read, you know, um, um, articles and things like that. I sort through all this research and only then usually two, three months in, then I start thinking about writing and how I want to structure the story. And, and Annette, between your interviewing and your own research, how did you strike that balance in order to tell a story? Um, because, you know, nonfiction, we want to get the facts out, but we really need 
to have that that narrative to pull us on to pull us through. And so how did you strike that balance? Yeah, it ended up, I was very excited that I was writing about a living person who could answer all my questions, but that ended up being a double-edged sword um, because Jennifer had so many stories. It was actually surprisingly hard for me to find a narrative thread that would be a picture book um, story. I wrote many drafts. There um, were drafts about very different events in her life and things like that. Um, so it ended up being a, more of a structural problem than I had expected. Um, for a little while, I had a draft about she and her sister had led a protest in the lunchroom um, because kids with disabilities weren't allowed to eat in the lunchroom. So I have one draft that was all about their lunchroom protest and things like that. Um, and so the uh, for this book, as opposed to other books where I'm basing it largely on written sources, um, the biggest problem was for me as a writer was figuring out uh, how to carry children through to the to the end point. And so I had to decide, like, what should the end point be? And that ended up being a bit of a challenge in the book because the ADA, while really important, hasn't solved all the problems for people with mm -hmm. disabilities. And so I wanted to acknowledge that, but also talk about like what it had done. And so once I had the ending, then it was easier to figure out how I could get to the ending. Um, but yeah, it ended up being a different set of problems than I had had with other books where I used written sources. So I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, oh absolutely. And, and Andrew, you talked about you were writing this book for yourself and you hadn't really um, envisioned it as something that you would you know, send to your agent and that would go through the process until, until your son read it. Is How do you go about um, crafting a story on usually that wasn't something that you were writing for yourself? When you sit down to write a YA novel, do you use a different process than the one you use just to write this one because you wanted to write it? Yeah, well, of uh, the 14 novels that I've published, I've only actually done a couple of them the the roadmap way where I you know uh, uh, my editor says hey I want a book from you here's a contract and I expect it by this time I've 12 out of 14 I've only just sat down and written only for myself and then I decide when I'm finished what if anything I'll do with them so um, that's, that's always been the most rewarding way of writing for me because I'm not writing to a deadline and I'm not writing for a paycheck. I'm writing to do something that I love to do. And when, I, when I'm finished with it, then I have to struggle within myself about whether or not I actually want some other stranger to read it because by far most of my work is, uh, going, to, is going to leave this planet with me. Um, and, uh, and I'm finished, I'm finishing a novel right now that nobody knows anything about. Um, that's just how I write. Do you start with character? Do you start with a, sto a story that you imagine? Do you start with a place? How do you get, how do you, what triggers um, the, the process for you or the storytelling process for you? I, I start, I usually start with something that um, the people in the story and the story itself is going to revolve around. So once I have that thing, uh, then I start to populate the, the little cars on the Ferris wheel with people, with characters. Um, and, uh, and I just kind of let it go from there. I'm a straight through writer. I write from the beginning to the end without an outline. But I find myself very often uh, writing and rewriting sometimes the same paragraph for weeks at a time. But that's just my way. My, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend my way of doing it to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we only have a few more minutes. And I'd like to ask each of you this question. Um, you know, with, with so many young people um, who have had to spend so much screen time, um, in the last 18 months or so. Um, and I think that if they would, whether it was poetry or whether it was a song or just 
telling, just journaling, that it would be a way to connect um, back with themselves, what would you recommend for them if they started off as new writers, as young writers, um, that kind of counterbalance the screen time they've been forced to um, spend? I'll start with you, Andrew. Well, um, <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, yeah. uh, in, uh, I've been back at school now for a month and here I, I teach in California and it was amazing for me to see on the first day when schools opened, I've never seen uh, so few absences. The kids were just coming back mm. like crazy. Just thousand, I teach in a school with over 2000 students and I was telling them on the first day, you know, you have been writing so much in the last year and a half. You haven't seen your friends, but you've been talking to them by texting and they text you and you're on Snapchat and Insta together. You do, you've been doing so much writing and they're, and they realize it. The thing that they've missed is they've missed the real being in a space with other human beings, mm -hmm. but they have definitely uh, been putting a lot of their hearts and souls and their struggles uh, down in words. They just haven't been doing it in the way that a lot of people from our generation expect them to, which is sit down and write a page or 150 right. words right. on what you've gone through in the last week. But uh, they've, they're communicators by nature uh, yeah. and uh, they're ready to go. They're ready to rock and roll right now. Oh, that's awesome. Lisa, do you have any recommendations for um, budding writers who might want to tell stories that, that um, are on their hearts or on their minds? Well, I think, you know, I think finding a way to, to journal and to um, find your own truth without um, an editor, meaning not an editor, the traditional editor, but a teacher, a parent, having that feeling of someone looking over your shoulder, I think is always really helpful. It's helpful for me to, to um, have a space to write without feeling like someone is um, correcting or revising. I think it gives you a freedom um, to express yourself um, in a way that um, you don't get when you're being, uh, your work is being looked at. So I think that um, having a way to like a, a daily writing practice in a journal um, on your phone, uh, where you're just writing without fear of being um, someone looking over your shoulder, I think is always really helpful. Um, and I think that always reading um, widely and broadly, um, I think that sometimes you're just kind of gathering thoughts. I think that you have to allow for gathering times where you're, where you're gathering um, great words and sentences from other writers and um, giving, your space, giving yourself the space to, to breathe as a writer and not having to worry about putting words on a page is also helpful. And Annette, what would you, what would you recommend to young writers? Yeah. Well, both of those are wonderful suggestions. Um, I think, I wanna preface it by saying I'm not an artist at all. I will never illustrate any of my books, but I think combining writing with, um, with picture making, with mm -hmm. drawing, it for me it um, allows me to enter a, a different kind of headspace. Um, so so maybe illustrating your own words or adding um, pictures to your journaling I think brings a new energy and makes it a different um, kind of uh, enterprise that that fosters creativity even if it's not anything you would ever show anyone else. Well, I want to thank you all for sharing. Um, and giving us this wonderful insight into the books that you have written and into your process. And um, I'm sure that all of our viewers will, you know, get a lot of insight about what you've done and how you do it, and maybe get a little encouragement to try it themselves. So thank you again. Um, we look forward to reading all of your books, most of them for me again, now that I've heard about the process. Look forward to looking at those books again. Once again, I want to thank Lisa Klein Ransom, Andrew Smith, and Annette Simatel for being with us this evening. Thank you, Doug. Thanks. Thank you.